Welcome to Business Authority Radio, bringing you insights from today's thought leaders, professionals, and influencers with your hosts, Neil Howe and Craig Williams. Hello and welcome to the show. This is your host, Neil Howe, and my special guest today is Rick Olson. Uh, Rick helps speakers ensure their audiences are laughing with them and not at them. He helps them get the laughs, get the attention, and get the results. Welcome to the show, Rick. Oh, thank you for having me on the show, Neil. I'm excited to be here. Excellent. Well, I'm excited to hear what you've got to say to make our presentations uh, stand out, definitely be funnier. But let's uh, talk about you, first of all. How did you get started uh, being a comedian? Well, I grew up. Uh, everybody said that I was so funny that I should do stand-up. And in fact, my parents' friends likened me to Spanky from The Little Rascals. <laughs> and so they said, hey, you're funny. You should do stand-up. But I always resisted because how I was funny with a group of people, I knew fundamentally was different than the way a stand-up comedian is funny, alone on the stage, giving all the information needed to make a laugh happen. But in 2010, my wife and I moved to Phoenix, and there was somebody had a meetup group, and they were doing a free introduction to stand-up comedy at the Tempe Improv. And I thought, well, if someone thinks they can teach it, I bet I could learn it. So... That's how I got started in stand-up comedy, and much to um, not not much to my surprise, but kind of as I expected, I, I struggled more than I wanted to. Uh, yeah, it's not exactly easy to stand in front of a crowd and get the laughs. You know, you might think in your head that you're the funny guy, but uh, that's not necessarily uh, what everybody else sure. is going to think all the time. There's different kinds of humor, right? Aren't there? Yes, exactly. And there's, there's not only different kinds of humor, it's a different skill set. Um, because in a group of people, when you're having drinks and dinner, all the information you need to make the laugh is happening organically right then. Uh, so it's a different skill set to communicate the joke on stage. And I, I read every book I could. I, I bought other online classes. And then finally, I found a guy out in LA who was doing Skype lessons and coaching and I thought well I'm going to I'm going to check out what he's got and in that first hour with him I learned more than what I had had the previous 15 weeks on my own and, and with the the local workshops and he said you know here's the nine reasons people laugh and number 9 is tickling and that doesn't apply to stand up comedy <laughs> unless uh, you want to get arrested so uh from there at working with him I I got my first paid stand up gig within 3 months and then uh, three years later, I got my first paid uh, headlining gig in stand-up comedy. Well, congratulations on that. Now, you know, myself, I grew up in Scotland, and there's a lot of, like, funny uh, guys in Scotland, you know, but it's usually more that back-and-forth banter around uh, a few drinks, uh, you know, where these one-liners come out. It seems to be very situational, and it's not really something that's structured. But tell me a little bit about the structure and what you learned on basically how to be funny. So in, in my process of working with Jerry with uh, the stand-up comedy clinic, I, I learned how to write jokes. I learned how to structure and, and to kind of do what I did naturally, but in, in a stand-up format. I also took improv classes. I took a, a correspondence course with Gene Parrott, who was Bob Hope's head monologue writer. And, and through all that, process, I learned that, well, uh, let me go full circle here. The, we were at dinner with a group of people and I was making everybody laugh, which wasn't out of the ordinary, but I realized that one of my mentor's joke formulas was in play or one of the comedy structures that I'd learned was in play. And I started paying attention. And every time I was quote unquote being naturally funny, I could point to one of those structures. And I thought, well, this is interesting. I, I thought I was being naturally funny, but it turns out I could, I could teach people what I did naturally using what I had learned through this intense study and, and process. So to wrap it around back to your question, the structure, the fundamental structure is surprise. Gene Parrott said, if surprise isn't present, you don't have comedy, you don't have humor. So surprise is the fundamental element. Mm. 
Definitely. Now, now that you know that there's a structure behind it, and you still do stand-up comedy right now, do you? Uh, I do very little, mostly um, and engage in the endeavor of coaching speakers or entrepreneurs who speak. And then also I've written a book and I have online classes. So most of my time now is uh, involved in the business of helping other people tap into this ability to be funny because it, it is a coveted skill set. And so I'm having as much fun helping other people get laughs as I did on my own. So you went through all the processes and you learned it uh, for yourself and you, you saw in, in different situations, even out at dinner and things like that, that there was actually a structure behind it. And uh, now you're taking the time to teach different people what people need to learn these kinds of things about how to be funny, especially this is a business show, so in the business world. Right. Well, as I got into the more of the heart of laughter and why we laugh, modern neuroscience is showing that the the neurological reasons why we laugh or the I guess the the human reason why we laugh is for connection. That it is a a verbal signal that I like you, I agree with you and I want to be in the same group with you. Mm-hmm. So laughter is about connection. So if you want to, if you're in a sales situation and you want to build rapport with your prospective client, being able to make them laugh with you, it shortcuts the rapport process. If you're, I'm sorry, go ahead. Okay. So obviously building rapport is extremely important in sales because people aren't going to buy anything from people that they don't like. So Explain why, you know, that rapport and the laughing and the funniness especially works to get people comfortable, I guess, with you. Right. If you can make your prospective client laugh, what, what modern science, like I said, not neuroscience is showing through functional MRI studies. Uh, Sophie Scott is a British neuroscientist, and she's the one that I'm relying on uh, who's studying this, that she says that that laugh signals safety. It When I laugh at something you've said, it means I like you and I'm comfortable with you. Because we don't laugh with people we don't like. We don't laugh when we're uncomfortable. Uh, in our brain, we have the, the first brain or the lizard brain. And all of our communication in business is filtered through our audience's first brain. And that first question they're always asking is, am I safe? And so that laugh breaks down that barrier, that resistance to influence, and lets you connect. So, obviously, people, you know, if they sense that you're a salesman at all, they immediately put the guard up, and that is that lizard brain that you're talking about. So, let's uh, look more into an actual presentation. Uh, What can you do in a presentation or why even are presenta- presentations so bad that they need to be injected with this comedy or, and humor? Yeah. Well, um, it's not necessarily that they're bad. It, it's that humor helps them be so much better. The, we like to laugh because, or I like to make people laugh because it helps them pay attention. You know, when, someone, when someone's laughing, what you say right after that, Uh, is going to be listened to more. I don't know if you've seen, there's a video of a stewardess or a flight attendant, I'm sorry um, for my improper use of the word (laughs) stewardess, a flight attendant who's giving announcements. Now, Neil, uh, the last time you flew, did you pay attention to those safety announcements at all? No. Right. But on YouTube, there's a video with, of flight safety announcements with nearly 4 million views at this point. Wow. Or three million. It, it, her name is Marty Marty Cobb, and what would cause people to go online to watch flight safety announcements if you're not willing to listen to them in the plane when when you need the information? And it's that laughter, right? It's got to be something special that stands out that people are going to remember, right? So, in your sales presentation, or in your marketing presentation, or whatever engagement you have with somebody. To influence them, you need to get them to listen to you. And humor is a great pattern interrupt that's going to get their attention. 
So what other problems do people have in their presentations? The, I, I think um, the, one of the biggest challenges that people have that I've seen is they don't consider the emotional journey that they want to take their audience on. They don't consider that if I'm, if I'm making more of a sales presentation, and that would include a nonprofit who's asking for donations of time or money, or really at the end of any presentation, you're going to give a call to action. You want them to change the way they act. You want to change the way they think. You're working towards an emotional build because all buying is on emotion. Mm-hmm. So they, so most of the the speakers or presenters or even business people that I work with haven't considered the emotional aspects of the words they're using. Now, when people are putting presentations together, they're probably not thinking too much about these laugh points somewhere in their presentation. What are a few misconceptions people may have about you know injecting humor and comedy into a business atmosphere or a presentation the biggest misconception is that it has to be hard or it has to be difficult to do the mm. one of the processes i've developed is to simply start with what is it you want to say and in the process of just getting out the words that are necessary in your presentation there are opportunities to generate laughs in that material with just by following the process I I teach. And that's uh, the laugh generator process. But let me give you an example. A speaker was sharing a story of going on a, using a sailboat going down from California into Mexico and he anchored his boat, but the wind came up and he was worried his boat would end up on the rocks. Now I said, Neil, if you had followed my process, you could have identified on the rocks as a potential play on words mm-hmm. because of the alcohol connotation, right? Mm-hmm. So with uh, following the process, you would see on the rocks and you'd go, oh, there's, there's an opportunity for me to do a couple different things, such as saying, um, I didn't want my boat to end up on the rocks, so I did what any captain would do. I went to the liquor cabinet because boat on the rocks bad, scotch on the rocks good. Yeah. You know, so something, something simple like that. And then of course the, the structure of the joke can get more complicated, but that's the foundational opportunity you have just because of the way English works. And of course you've got uh, the English language that you just uh, talked about, but there's also uh, images and pictures or cartoons. How important is it to inject a different form of media like that in your presentations? Oh, well, it can be one of the most powerful as well as the most easy to do because as humans, we take in so much information visually. We are visually dominant uh, as far as uh, assessing information. So, for example, when I work with a speaker, um, one of the things I have to make sure and cue them on is when you change your slides and depending on what, if you have words on there, don't speak while the words are up there because your audience isn't going to listen. They're going to process the visual information first. It takes higher priority. So that's what you're talking about. You know, you throw a cartoon or a, a very vivid image of a photograph of what you're describing. It can be an excellent way to get a laugh in a presentation. So Rick, let's talk about uh, money for a moment and why it's important to inject humor uh, into a presentation or any kind of business setting, what difference does it make to the bottom line? Well, it it makes a difference in two ways. As the presenter or as the salesperson or the leader, the, the ability to generate a laugh helps you lighten up. It helps you have a laugh, and there's all sorts of physiological benefits of laughter, lowered stress, increased motivation, problem-solving, creativity. All of those benefits are huge when you're addressing business challenges and business opportunities. And then when you can do that in a business setting, if you're giving a pitch, trying to get a big contract, uh, I just read, um, oh, shoot, 
oh, I don't remember the name of the book. Um, but they gave an example of being likable, that they went with a different team, even though they felt both teams were sound fun fundamentally, they went with the team they thought was going to be more fun to work with. Now, that's huge. It seems to be, uh, you know, I've visited a lot of different uh, companies, uh, newer companies where we've got millennials uh, working. That seems to be a very prominent display now, having that fun atmosphere, community atmosphere within the workplace rather than, you know, just the your, your two by four uh, cubicle that many people are, you know, used to. So it certainly seems like fun does help the bottom line, and I imagine with creativ creativity as well. Yeah, absolutely. Now, if you're a potential client of mine, and, and I can't make you laugh, uh, well, let me reverse it. If I'm able to make you laugh, and whenever we talk on the phone or whenever uh, we're together and have a meeting, I get you to laugh, we have a good time, I can get back into your door easier you're not going to shun me as much because yeah, I want to do business with you, but you enjoy being around me as much as you do our business relationship. Mm, so it's so, really, it's really about connection and, you know, connecting with people on a real level rather than just, you know, a formal business level. Yeah, absolutely. We, you know, the fundamental, the golden rule, Bob Berg's golden rule is we do business with people we know, like, and trust. Mm -hmm. And that applies to influences. We're willing to be influenced by people we know, like, and trust. Now, let's talk about the timing of a presentation. Is there anything that anybody listening who's thinking about doing a presentation right now needs to know about the timing of maybe, you know, a little levity or getting a laugh during the presentation? One that I would imagine would be beneficial to the speaker is to have you know something right up front because like you just said it relieves a little bit of the stress and it gets people to relax but are there any other times during a presentation where it is important to inject a little bit of humor yeah uh what you said about the intro the opening remarks is a great one because the getting that first laugh puts you at ease as well as your audience in fact in the book TED Talks, uh, the, the author shares the story of Monica Lewinsky's TED Talk and how she was super nervous, high anxiety, none of the typical techniques for lowering anxiety were working, but what finally worked for her was when the audience laughed at her, her real first joke. Mm -hmm. and, and as we started the show talking about that laughter be, was about connection, that laugh signaled to Monica that they like me, they agree with me, and they want to be in the same group with me, right? right? So that lower, lowers the stress on the presenter. Now, in terms of the rest of the presentation, let me start by saying the one place you don't want to laugh, have a laugh, you want to be very careful about having a laugh, is in the close. One of the fundamental reasons we laugh as humans is to release tension. And you may... There may be somebody in your life who laughs nervously or, or laughs inappropriately. Some of that is social tension that they're laughing to, to uh, relieve. But in a sales situation, you're building to an emotional close. There is tension there because your prospect, your potential customer knows you're going to ask for the order. And you want that tension to be relieved by taking action, either buying your product or volunteering for your organization or whatever it is you're after you want that action to relieve the tension so if you put a laugh in at that point then you run the risk of the laugh relieving the tension and walking away without the order i see very important now there are different types of humor there you know there's dry humor uh you know there's just sil silly humor i'm sure they have different names but there's different types of humor how can you know which type of humor to include? Should you include them all? And will some possibly be offensive to members in a, in a group? Yeah. When I work with a client, we focus on working with that client's natural humor. So we know what they like to laugh at and we know uh, what 
what they do naturally. Um, so that to me, that that's the most important part. And that's why my main process is just use the words you want to use in your presentation and we'll find the natural laugh points within that without so much worrying about the structure. And then regarding safety or um, offensive humor, there's two points you need to know if your, your humor is going to be offensive. Typically, humor or a joke has a target. So you have to be able to know, does your, does your joke have a target and who is the target? And then you relate that, that back to your audience and go, what is your audience's emotional connection to that target? So if I'm speaking at the Democratic Convention, mm -hmm. I am free to make a joke about Republicans, any right. Republicans all Republicans. The reverse isn't true, potentially, right? Um, because if, you know, Ronald Reagan, well known for his self-deprecating humor, he would be more open and the Re Republicans would be more open to that type of joke. But the second piece is subtext. What is the hidden meaning in your joke? What is it really saying? And it's those two things that you have to understand about humor, in particular, your own style, whether or not you are going to risk offending your audience. Right. They say there's a little truth in every joke, but that is uh, some very important information to know about um, the target, you know, the yes. target who, who the joke may offend. So. Rick, if somebody was working with you or you're working with somebody, talk to me about the process. Uh, what do you do with them? How, how do you start? How do you sit them down? What's the process right. to get them through a presentation? So it does start with a conversation of me understanding how, how, business, how their business is affected by their speaking or presenting. And then from there, I can craft a recommendation on where to start. So typically, you know, storytelling is really big right now and people love stories, but they really love stories that are funny. Mm -hmm. so, so we look at the repeatable pieces of your presentation because we often don't give the same presentation more than once, but there are elements that we repeat, like our origin story. You know, like Neil, if I asked you how you got started uh, doing what you do, you would tell me a story. Right. Right. So that would be one of the first places I work with somebody on is, you know, let's work on the natural opportunities that's in your origin story of how you got started, why you're in front of this client or in front of this audience right now. I work and, with, go ahead. And there's different stories for different things or different areas within a presentation. Each need their own little story. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. And so we look at those the presentation and I, I love it when a client comes to me and they have their presentation on video or at least audio because we have it, I have it transcribed and we, we walk through it and then I identify the key points that are going to be um, high value targets. And those are those stories. And oftentimes uh, a client will go, will say to me like, well, you know, I'm, I, I teach people how to eat their vegetables. So I don't think there's any room for humor in that. And I, well, you'd be surprised. And then they say something like, I'm a veggie evangelist. Mm -hmm. And I go, oh, wow. Do you, let me show you. If you just said what you just did, I'm a veggie evangelist, which is that was in her presentation. I said, if you followed it up with, I go door to door teaching people the good news of Brussels sprouts. I said, you're going to get a laugh. Right. Now, there's, a, there's something that can be found in anything, really. Yeah. As boring as it may seem. Absolutely. So that's what I, I really enjoy about the work I do because I make it accessible where so many people dismiss their ability to be funny because they believe it has to be natural or um, from birth. Mm, so it can be taught and uh, you have written a book, Hook 'em with Humor. Uh, tell me about your book and uh, what people could expect from reading it. Uh, well, the, the book, the subtitle is The Public Speaker's Guide to Having Fun. And that was important for me to have in there because it is about you, the speaker, having fun. Um, so the full subtitle is The Public Speaker's Guide to Having Fun and Using Humor to Mesmerize, Fascinate, and Engage. And in there, I, I, make, I demystify humor, first of all, so that 
anyone can understand the mechanics or the near mathematical precision that humor employs. And then from there, I have several processes that I've developed through my experience on just how do you, how can you get a few laughs and then how can you get, turn those into bigger laughs? And, and that's the visual aspect of delivery. You know, there's some timing in there, but then if you add a simple facial expression, when you deliver the joke, that can get you a bigger laugh, a longer laugh, and then uh, how to turn that one laugh that you're, you may already be getting, how to turn that into two, three, or four laughs. But then beyond that, I go into troubleshooting because a lot of people, they may, they may be humorous, but it's hit or miss. And the troubleshooting section really clears that up for them and explains why jokes don't work when they're, when they're not working and what you can adjust to get a consistent laughs when you want them. Yeah, and I imagine if you are a public speaker and you do a lot of speaking, especially if you're traveling around the country or around the world uh, to different audiences, uh, there's got to be some kind of formula to it to get that joke because your delivery, I'm, I'm sure, is extremely important because, hey, you've probably said that same joke a hundred times And, (laughs) you know, it might not be funny to you, but the way you deliver it has got to be funny to the audience. Right. Absolutely. And part of that goes back to making sure you're having a good time, you know, so do they know it's a joke, you know, and there's the pieces, do, do they know one of the fundamental references that you're using? You know, are, are they familiar with all the information? And that's sometimes where, have you ever been telling a story and you get to the end and you go, I guess you had to be there. Right. Yeah. Right. So that's, that's what I feared when I did stand up comedy was, I guess you had to be there. Uh, um, but that's one of the things we look at. And that's why I love working off the transcript. Uh, because when you, when you look at the transcript, you know exactly what was said. And then you can say, Oh, look, you left out the fact that, um, that you drink coffee every day. And if you don't, if you don't, if the audience doesn't know that fact about you, the joke isn't funny. Mm-hmm. Right. So it's it's very interesting that it is formulaic and you, you can really teach somebody to be funny even if you know they're not necessarily considered funny. But to get that reaction from the crowd, that is gonna put people at ease and ultimately it helps the bottom line by uh selling more stuff. Well, Rick, uh Lots of great information from you today in regards to injecting humor into a business and presentations. What is a good way for people to get in touch with you if they want help with their presentations? The best way is to hit me up on my website, a funnier you.com. That's a funnier Y O U.com. There's a contact form there. And then I also have, you know, blog articles. I have a free, um, lesson or free online class on, you know, five steps to get more laughs. So you can take my laugh generator process for a test drive and you can test me on it and you can use it for yourself and find out that you can be funnier. Excellent. Very handy resource then. Well, thank you very much, Rick Olson, for joining me on Business Authority Radio. And to our guests, uh, if you like what you hear, hit that like button and share, and we'll see you next time on the show. You've been listening to Business Authority Radio with Neil Howe and Greg Williams. To learn more about the resources mentioned in today's show or to listen to past episodes, visit businessauthorityradio.com.